When we did derivations in sentential logic, we learned these negation of rules, negation of conditional, de Morgan's, double negation, and negation of biconditional. It turns out that these are really useful for symbolizing. We can generate lots of logically equivalent sentences this way, and it also explains why some people would symbolize something one way and others a different way. It's because they're actually equivalent, you're just looking at it in a slightly different way. What we're missing in predicate logic is the application of these negation of rules for our quantifiers. And so what are they? That's what we're going to explore in today's video. How do I symbolize not all restaurants are good? Okay, there are my predicates, f for restaurant, g is good, and I know that I have to deal with the negation here, which is the not. Uh, well, the symbolization of this is very straightforward. I know that there's my group property division, and I know that this is a universal because it says all. So it seems that I have three primary options that obey the canonical form, and the question is, where should I stash the negation? So we just actually have to ask and try and interpret what each of these sentences means, and then we'll be able to identify the right one. Well, for the first one, the negation is next to the universal. So this is actually sort of straightforward. This means not all. It's not all fx arrow gx. That definitely seems to capture the meaning of not all restaurants are good. So what about the one in the middle? Well, here, this is sort of strange. I put the negation in the group. So this says something like, everything that is not a restaurant is good. All non-restaurants are good. But that doesn't seem to actually capture the meaning at all about not all restaurants are good, because I don't know anything about like a rock or that car outside or anything like that, because those are non-restaurants. I don't know if they're good or bad. That cannot be the right symbolization. Now, what about the negation at the back here? Well, this says everything that is a restaurant is not good. I hope that makes sense. So this says all not, which is another sort of odd way of saying none. So that's an important phrase, but it's not capturing the meaning that we want here. Okay, so that one's good. How about the sentence, some restaurants are not good? How do I symbolize that? Again, I can do the standard breakdown that we're used to. This is an existential, same group property division, etc. And here are my three options for where I can put the negation. So which one is the right one? Well, let's go through. The first one says not some. So not the case that some restaurant is good. That doesn't capture the meaning that some restaurants are not good. The middle one, again, is also strange. Here the negation is on the restaurants. So this is saying something about some non-restaurant. But I don't want to talk about some non-restaurant. I want to talk about some restaurant. So this can't be it either. And so the last one says, there is something that is a restaurant and is not good. Some restaurants are not good. So this some is not is the correct phrasing and is what we're looking for. Now, if you're paying attention, you may have realized that if I say not all restaurants are good and some restaurants are not good, are the same. They have the same meaning. So if I wanted to symbolize not all restaurants are good, I could pick either of these symbolizations. And this is what we're going to really focus on today, the notion of how to deal with a negation and quantifiers like the universal or the existential. So either one of these would be an acceptable answer for not all restaurants are good. Now you might ask, hey, should I symbolize their existent x, fx, and gx? So if I say not all restaurants are good, should I pick one of those uh, good answers at the top and then add to it, and there is a good restaurant? Because if I say not all restaurants are good, doesn't that mean that some restaurant is good and at the same time some restaurant isn't good or something like that? This is sort of tricky. What we want to differentiate is the difference between logical implication and logical compatibility. So I'm just going to present some technical definition here. This doesn't really matter that much, and it's something that you're already familiar with from logical equivalence. So a sentence logically implies another sentence if whenever the first one is true, then the second one must be true. Uh, that sort of seems to make sense. If two sentences logically imply each other, then we say they are logically equivalent. And again, this is something we know from before. So what does logical compatibility mean? We'll say psi is logically compatible with phi, if when phi is true, it is possible that psi is true, but not necessary. It doesn't have to be the case. So they're compatible. It could be true, it could be false, they're compatible. When we symbolize, we only care about logical implication and logical equivalence. In fact, logical equivalence is the one we really care about a lot. But we do not care about things that are logically compatible. And in fact, we want to explicitly avoid symbolizing things that are merely compatible, because it could be that they're actually false. So when I say not all restaurants are good, 
and there is a good restaurant. It seems to be uh, that these are implied if I, the first one implies the second, but that's actually not the case. If I say not all restaurants are good, it could actually be because every single restaurant is bad. I just didn't want to say it out loud or something like that, or maybe I don't know. Now, it's possible that there's a good restaurant, which makes these compatible, but we don't want to symbolize it because we don't know that it is true. Similarly, if I say no restaurants are good, can I say there is a not good restaurant? So no restaurants are good. Can I then infer, oh, there must be a bad restaurant? Uh, in fact, you can't infer that because one of the reasons why no restaurants are good is certainly that there could be a bad restaurant out there. But another reason why no restaurants are good could be that there are just no restaurants. You know, some, something happened, someone snapped his fingers or whatever and got rid of every single restaurant in the universe. Well, then it would be the case that no restaurants are good. And it's not because there is a bad restaurant. It's because there just aren't any. So these are compatible and we need to be careful. So back to this example, should I add there exists X, F, X, and G, X? There is a good restaurant when I symbolize this. And of course, the answer is no. You just want to symbolize the thing that is explicitly contained. All right, so we took a little detour there into the idea of logical implication versus compatibility. So let's get back on track. What we're really trying to focus on are our quantifiers and their relationship to negation. And so here are four classic possibilities. I can have not all, some is not, none of, and not some is. And when I say it that way, it's sort of awkward, but you can sort of look at my sort of toy example here where I move the negation around in terms of the canonical forms of my uh, quantifiers. And what I want to point out is that the two rows that I have here are equivalent. So if I say not all, that's equivalent to saying something is not. And if I say none of, that's equivalent to saying it's not the case that something is. And so in whenever you have a phrasing like this that you need to symbolize, you can pick whichever one you want to symbolize it in terms of. Do you want to symbolize it as a universal or as a existential? And that's totally up to you. Of course, going up and down, those are not equivalent. So be careful. Don't accidentally symbolize none when you mean not all. There is another sort of general takeaway here that we observed earlier. In general, you don't want to negate the group. You don't want to negate the subject. That, that typically doesn't work out, and it typically doesn't capture the meaning of what it is you're trying to do. So we already know that group and property is relative, but what this sort of lesson in negation and quantifying is actually teaching you is that your quantifier choice is also relative. Where someone might see a universal, you may see an existential, and vice versa. So this typically happens when there are negations in play. Don't worry too much about finding the right choice for the quantifier. In fact, there is no right choice. You can pick either one and symbolize the sentence correctly when there are negations in play. What you need to make sure is that you put your negations in the right spot. So the quantifier choice is relative to where you think the negation should go. Should it go before the quantifier or should it go in the property? Those are typically your two options. Another thing that hinges on this is that you'll then see that what you think the group property is also depends on your choice of quantifier and negation as well. So everything is sort of wrapped up in the way that you're sort of interpreting the meaning of the sentence. And so that's why taking time to like stare at it and think about the group and property distinction and the quantifiers really matters. So here's quantifier negation and symbolization in sort of a practical way. Uh, quantifier negation is this move where you can go back and forth between quantifiers. But in symbolization, what you do is you would move the negation to the property and you can switch the quantifier. So if I want to say not all, there are two ways to do it. You could say negation of the universal, or you could move that negation to the property and you switch the quantifier from the universal to the existential, and then you get the form sum is not. And those are equivalent. It doesn't matter which one you want to do. Similarly, there's an equivalence for saying none. How do I symbolize none? Well, if you symbolize it as not something is the case, then you get the negated existential. But when you use quantifier negation, you would move that negation to the property and you switch the quantifier from the existential to the universal and you get a different form of none. For everything, if you're the subject, then you're not the property. That is to say, nothing has that property. So this is quantifier negation or QN. 
in symbolization. We're going to look at an example or two and see how this sort of uh, plays out when we're actually using it in a problem. None of the cats dislike Calvin, who is a good dog. So again, there's a, a things that jump out immediately for me. I have a non-restrictive clause here, which is the who is a good dog. Well, who is a good dog? It's Calvin. Uh, I also have used a name letter here because we haven't symbolized with name letters much. So this is an easy example. The first thing I'm going to symbolize is Calvin is a good dog. Remember, with name letters, you do not need, or nor should you have, actually, I'm going to say that stronger, you shouldn't even have a quantifier because you don't need a quantifier at all. So I just want to say Calvin is a good dog. So I say Calvin is a dog and Calvin is good. That's it. No quantifier needed. That's how I symbolize Calvin is a good dog. So now I just want to symbolize the rest, which is none of the cats dislike Calvin. How do I do that? Well, I have to be worried about the word none. But I also see that there's the group, which I think is cats, and the property, which I think is dislike Calvin. Okay, so how do I symbolize? Well, you just pick any of the forms that we uh, selected already for none. None of the cats dislike Calvin. So I'm going to start with this one. It's not the case that there is something that is a cat and has the property that they don't like Calvin. That seems to capture the meaning of none of the cats dislike Calvin. Now I can use my quantifier negation in practice and move the negation to the back, to the property, and switch the quantifier. So then I have, for everything, if you're a cat, then it's not the case that it's not the case that you like Calvin. But of course we know this is ridiculous. I would just drop those two negations and get for all x, bx, error, lx. But what does this really say? This just says all cats like Calvin. The moral of this story is that if you ever see multiple negations in a statement, you may just want to paraphrase them out first and symbolize the simpler statement. It would have been far easier for me to say, none of the cats dislike Calvin. Hey, doesn't that just mean every cat likes Calvin? And if I had convinced myself, yes, I would have just symbolized that in about two seconds, no problem. So this type of paraphrasing is really, really important when you have negations, especially. Paraphrasing gets you out of a lot of complicated symbolizations and stops you from making uh, some critical errors. So this is a nice example of that. And the next example, it's going to be even more important. Neither coffee nor tea is good for you unless it is Monday. Okay, here's my symbolization scheme. Notice that in this one, I'm using an atomic statement letter P to represent it is Monday. So there's nothing fishy about this. Your All your sentential stuff fits perfectly with all the predicate stuff, no problem. All right, let's get started. What is the group here and what's the property? I always start the same. So neither coffee nor tea, that seems to be the group, the subject, what we're talking about. And the property is that they're good for you unless it's Monday. Okay. I also really like asking, am I talking about all coffee or tea or am I talking about some coffee or tea? It seems that this is a universal claim, or at least to me, it seems like it's a universal claim. So that's how I'm going to start. Now, our first attempt at this is pretty straightforward. I have for all x. I'm going to connect it to the conditional in the middle. The property, good for you unless it's Monday, I remember that unless easily symbolizes as a disjunction. So the gx or p, that's pretty straightforward. And I also remember the form of neither nor, that's the negation with the disjunction in the middle. So that's why I came up with not bracket ax or dx close bracket. Okay, this is a decent attempt, but it's not the right answer. And it's actually critically wrong for an, uh, a sort of funny reason. Take a close look at the group here. The group says everything that is neither coffee nor tea, because that's what neither nor is in the antecedent. Everything that is neither coffee nor tea has the property that it's good for you unless it's Monday. So in essence, I'm saying that even this like rat poison or whatever is good for you uh, unless it's a Monday. But that doesn't seem right at all. That's not capturing the meaning of me saying neither coffee nor tea is good for you. I'm not talking about rat poison. Somehow, I've critically got the group wrong. And this cannot be. So what is the group, really? Uh, well, there's lots of ways of thinking about what the group is, but we just need to be more careful. So here's one way. I can say that the group is, what I'm really talking about, is coffee and tea. I'm talking about coffee and tea. And I'm talking about all coffee and tea. But if I think that this is about all coffee and tea, I need to sort of figure out what the property is. 
Now, before I continue to the property, I'm just going to start my symbolization. I know how to symbolize all coffee and tea are, which is just the antecedent of a canonical form of universal. And of course, I know you caught this. This is, of course, the cat dog example. So I'm not going to symbolize the group with a conjunction. I'm going to use a disjunction. And it says for all x, ax, or dx. So here's the start of my symbolization. All coffee and tea are what? Well, let's look up at the top. My original statement that I need to symbolize is neither coffee nor tea is good for you unless it is Monday. So if I paraphrase that statement to say all coffee and tea are, and I need to find the property, well, the property isn't a straightforward property. I'm going to say that they're not something. All, neither coffee nor tea is good for you unless it is Monday. That means that all coffee and tea are not good for you unless it is Monday. And this is sort of not super straightforward when you're trying hard to paraphrase it. But if I just said the sentence, neither coffee nor tea is good for you unless it is Monday, intuitively, you would just know, oh, Alex is saying coffee and tea aren't really good for you. You would just know that intuitively. But there's something challenging about paraphrasing it when I'm asking you to do it on the spot. So you want to try and stick to that intuitive knowledge. So the paraphrase here is all coffee and tea are not good for you unless it is Monday. And symbolizing that is pretty straightforward. Not GX unless it is Monday or P. No problem. That's the correct symbolization. So it turns out that the neither nor caused some problems for us. And the way we solved it was through a very straightforward paraphrase. There's another way to see this, which I'm going to go through pretty quickly. You might have thought that the group here was coffee or tea, and it's a, an existential claim. This is not a universal claim. So if I say neither coffee nor tea is good for you unless it is Monday, you could have praised it, as, paraphrased it as saying, there is no such thing that is coffee or tea. There is no coffee or tea that is. And then the question is, what's the property? Well, let's just get started. There is no coffee or tea. So it's not the case that there is something that's coffee or tea. And, and now I have to get to the property. So what's the property? If I say neither coffee nor tea is good for you unless it is Monday, that is equivalent to saying there is no coffee or tea that is good for you and it is not Monday. So somehow I'm saying something about it being not Monday. If it's not Monday, then there's no coffee or tea that's good for you. Uh, I find this one a little less natural for me, but I've talked to many people who find this to be the most natural understanding of neither coffee nor tea is good for you unless it is Monday. So this one I have a little bit of difficulty with, but it doesn't matter. You can just pick the paraphrase, the one that fits most naturally with how you understand the sentence intuitively. Okay, so there are my two answers to this problem, uh, but you may have noticed that I did something that I told you not to do. So take a quick look at this. There's something funny about these symbolizations uh, that sort of violates something that I told you not to do. And it turns out that this symbolization goes against my best sort of practice, my tips for how to handle scope. I told you you should always open a scope whenever you're talking about a subject and close a scope when you're done talking about that subject, when you're essentially when you no longer need that variable. But notice in these sentences, the letter P, or in the bottom one, the, the negation P, is still under the scope of the quantifier. So you may have arrived at this answer, where you actually closed the parentheses and allowed uh, a sort and put the P on its own. So it's not under the scope of the quantifier. Now it turns out these are all correct, and it just has something odd to do with the word unless but I really just didn't want to sort of dwell on it too much. I wanted to sort of just like keep going with our flow. If you think that you naturally arrive at the bottom set, you're not doing nothing wrong. In fact, you're following my tips really nicely. But if you arrived at the top set, it's, it's perfectly fine. This example does not come up very often, and I won't address this type of problem again until we do multi-place predicate logic. So the key concept here is that quantifiers are relative, and you need to know how quantifier negation work. But the last real sort of important thing is the idea of paraphrasing and meaning is really, really powerful and important tool in symbolization. Next video, we're going to look at the word only and how only works in predicate logic. We already know how to tackle it in sentential, so it's not so bad for what's left. 
but we will take a quick look at some of the new ambiguities that arise in predicate logic from the English language.